doing? Are we having fun? I'm having a lot of fun. There's nothing better than me talking and you listening. It's beautiful. Nobody listens to me at my house. Every single time my kid asks me a question, they're like, stop. I don't want the life lesson, the appropriate scripture verse, just an answer. Just yes or no. All right, so are you in the right spot? You're supposed to be here with me talking about the measureless love of God. True story? Someone just said to me, I love your energy. And I said, for every person who loves it, there'll be 10 who cannot stand me. And you'll just have to pray for me. That's what you do. Okay? So I'm so excited to be with you today because I did get invited back a second time. And to come into this space and place, I think some of you, I don't want to say you would take this for granted, but I think sometimes our normal seems normal. And to be in a diocese as this, um, that's absolutely thriving, um, literally constant examples of people living the gospel values, it is really inspiring. And so it is a privilege to be back in this space among such holy women. And, and you don't even scare me anymore. <laughs> yeah, you don't even scare me. Melanie was one of the first people I met when I came back to the church. And Melanie's like that mother who does everything. Like, you think that she's so cute, but you're seething inside. You know that, you know that woman? And then when you find out she loved Jesus for real, then you just love her even more. All right, so here's a... Oh, I have, to, I have to learn how to do this. So we're here in the measureless love talk. We're talking about the measureless love of God. And it's my first day with a clicker. I am blonder than I pay to be, so bear with me. So this little um, picture is our, our oldest son, Carter. He's 23 years old now. And one of the gifts he got when he was born, or I got when he was born, was this a bear that he named, as soon as he could, Regular Bear. Kind of original. This is, reg this is my regular bear. See, the cool thing about this bear, I need you to really kind of hone in on some of these photos, because I think the first time Carter got it, it was that bottom left-hand picture. Can you see that? Yeah. So that's the first time that he really embraced it, and he recognized, like, I'm going to grab onto that thing, I'm going to grasp it, I'm going to hold onto it so tight. He didn't do anything without Regular Bear. As you can see, the picture to the right, he watched movies with Regular Bear, he slept with Regular Bear, nothing came between him and Regular Bear, not even his grandfather, as you can see in the bottom photo. He even went to work with Regular Bear, far right. Um, Top left, nothing was going to come between him and his regular bear. So regular bear, as you can see, is in front of his brother in the wagon. See that? Regular bear had the best seat in the house. And then he ate with regular bear. He brought regular bear to Disneyland. And it, it might look as if regular bear did not make it to that baptism. But I need you to look in the far right, the woman with the white suit on. She's holding the regular bear. Okay, so we got him like at least out of the family photo and like down to the right. Here's the deal. There was a time where my son lost regular bear. And I don't, I mean, it kind of contradicts everything I told you, which is he doesn't do anything without it. But for some reason, all of a sudden, it was not locatable. And the difference in my son when he realized that he didn't have this thing became evident how dependent upon it he was when he did have it. Does that make sense? You know how you miss something when it's gone? It's like, oh gosh, it wasn't really that bad after all, right? So he, he was just literally beside himself. It was so awkward and uncomfortable for him to do anything because that, that was just his go-to. Do you get that? That was his go-to. For, for maybe about a month, I did what any mother would do. At the time, I was very successful, and I had two girls that worked for me, and it became their full-time mission to get my son what he wanted and needed, because we always want our kids to get everything they want and they need, until you realize that that's not what they needed or wanted anyway. But anyway, I put them in charge. 40 hours a week, you find this darn bear. I don't know the name of it. I don't know who made it, but you do whatever it takes to get it. So literally, Federal Express would come to my house every day with a different bear. And we'd open it up, and my son would take it out and go. 
about 10 times. Finally, he accepted a bear as a secondary version because I think he realized, like, it's gone. Like, it will never be. What I thought I had can't be again. So he accepted this other bear. Well, we used to travel every weekend to Lake Geneva, where I live now, and we packed a cooler all the time. And my husband started screaming one day. Well, he screams a lot, actually, but, and, and so we usually ignore him. But at that point, it was a different kind of scream. It was a scream of, a, like, joyful, right? So I went running down the basement stairs. Well, out he pulled regular bear. It was in the cooler. It was in the cooler that we packed every single weekend. All I can tell you is to see my son's face when this, no, just, you know, currently this is stuffed with pantyhose. If I could get a close up of what this bear really looks like, it's actually kind of creepy. I mean, I wouldn't, I think this would be a scary thing to sleep with and to wake up to. But he loved on it, like, go back to that one photo, if you would, my friend, where it was that, see what it used to look like? See what it used to look like? He loved on it so bad that this is what it turned into. Everything changed again for my son that day. It was like he was back where he was supposed to be, doing what he was supposed to do. It was like a sense of peace. And for that period of time, he was visibly unsettled. The reason that I start with that story is because I think all of us can relate in some way, shape, or form to where God was the most important thing. Where there'd be nothing that we would allow to come between him and us. We bring him everywhere, to work, to bed, to sleep, to just everywhere. And then life gets in the way. And sometimes we feel like we've lost him. My son was smart enough to not settle when, when duplicates or replicas showed up. He knew what he wanted, and he wasn't settling for less. Can anyone relate to that time and space where maybe you decided you would be willing to settle for less? And then God wouldn't have it. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Isn't it awesome how we feel sometimes like we lost them? It can never be what it once was. Well, is there, are any of you married? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Do you have kids? Okay. We, does any, did anyone know what they were signing up for? I mean, and who thinks I'm going to fall off this stage? Just be truthful. <laughs> it would be so fun. The bishop would be appalled. Anyway, here's the deal. This whole thing about the measureless love of God, it, it's visible. It, Shannon just described it. You can taste it. You can touch it. You can, se you can sense it in every way. And unless we constantly bring it top of mind, focus it in, always be mindful of it. It's just so easy to have it, I don't want to say be lost, but just not be as prevalent. Can anyone relate to that? Can you? Tell me God is good if you can relate to that. God is good? Okay, so here's the thing about the measureless love of God. We're talking, I'm, I'm just going to hold it because I feel like it might be giving me some peace. So the measureless love of God is something that I don't think we think about enough. And oftentimes, if we try to think about it, it seems unfathomable, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem unfathomable? Based on the way I was described, do you actually think it's easy for me to recognize that God still loves me after all that? I had a girlfriend in my Bible study and she said to me, you know what, I just need you to know that if God loves you, I now know he really loves me. Like she was kind of uncertain and then she, but, but first she prefaced it with like, are you sure God loves you? And I go, yup. And she goes, but are you sure you're forgiven? I'm like, even more so. And she goes, this is the good news of the gospel. This is good stuff. 
So the thing about, God's, thing about God is that he is meticulous with measurements. He is meticulous with measurements. He measured the daily manna. He measured the temple. He measured every, he measured, do you know that? Do you know how many times God says the word measure in scripture? It's gotta be important because in one book, the book of Ezekiel, he mentions something to do with measuring 49 times. Measuring, I don't even know how to sew. Isn't this so funny that I'm holding this? I, don't, I do not know how to sew, but anyway. So God is so meticulous with measurements and there's a scripture verse that says, who marked off the dimensions? Who stretched a measuring tape across it? This is a tool I learned when I gave this talk. It's a tool, this is a tool for measuring. See. He literally meticulously measured everything. I need to tell you, just so you're absolutely sure about how meticulous God is with measurements, is that the Hummel Space Agency says that there's 80 billion galaxies in the universe, 200 to 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, 12 billion light years from Earth, which is the furthest point detected in 1998, and the Earth is the only place known to support life in the universe. Did God measure that out perfectly? So when we talk about the fact that God's love is measureless, he understands what it means to measure stuff. He's telling us it's the exact opposite. It cannot be measured. Do we sometimes measure God's love? Do we sometimes measure the love that we give to other people? Bishop Kagan said in the, in the booklet, you're here to love. And I love people when they do what I want, when I want, how I want. I just do. And then maybe I give them a little bit more love if they do it all the time. When we talk about the measureless love of God, I think it's like a really difficult thing to grasp. And the reason it is, is because so many times we judge the measureless love of God based on, you can see I'm really, oh, there's my family. Let's get distracted. There's my family. Do we look happy? We were so not happy. In that picture, I said a lot of swear words. I made a lot of threats. And of course, as you can see, I've dressed my 23-year-old and 21-year-old the same as their dad. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? And just for you Catholics, I did not write Merry Christmas on the table, it was there. I did not write, because I would have put M-A-R-Y Christmas. That's what I would have put. Isn't that the cutest thing? I just wanted you to see who I'm talking about. Okay, so when we're talking about this thing called measuring, we got to ask ourselves a couple questions. I'd like to say, ask you who, who are you measuring up to? Who's your person? Who's the person that you measure yourself by? We all have that person. You know, Shannon just talked about the lies. Those are lies. Those are truths with a small t that we make truths with a capital T. Do you do that? Or are Shannon, and I, are Shannon and I the only ones who ever do that? If so, we really need to go to a new diocese, Shannon. So that measuring up person, it might be someone we idolize, it might be someone we despise. We check each other out. I got out of my hotel room today and who did I walk into? Shannon. First thing she said to me is, well, you're all dressed up and cute. I think you said cute. At least I wanted to hear you said I look cute. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that isn't even my real outfit. I'm going to be changing in an hour. We think we're doing fine until we look left or we look right. And all of a sudden we decide either we're doing better or we're, we're doing worse. We're either superior or inferior. Does anybody do that? We do not know the woman who has it all together because she, she, she doesn't exist. For many years of my life, I just tried to keep it together so you thought it was together. It was crap. 
And now I'm just happy to say, I'm inspired by women who hold it together when it's all falling apart. Those women who walk profoundly in their faith with their eyes fixed on Jesus, knowing that we know how the story ends. Don't we? Sometimes we don't live like that. Sometimes we live like we don't know how the story ends. Second Corinthians says, how do I measure up compared to another? Sometimes we need to either make someone else feel worse in order, some of you are thinking, I don't want to be friends with you. I'm just speaking the truth. Sometimes God brings up the stuff that Shannon talked about, brings it up as the reminder that it's got to go. We bring it up and out. Don't we know that? The only way through, the only way out is through. Right, so as we're, as we're looking in a mirror and thinking, is it this? First of all, don't ever look in a mirror this way, I'm just saying. Don't ever do that. There's a reason why your eyes go that way, I'm just saying. So when those things come up, those insecurities, those feelings of inferiority, of not being enough, I think God wants us to go, Mwah! Bye-bye now. And say goodbye to it once and for all. Because we're made in the exact image and likeness of God. When you look in the mirror, do you know and do you say, I look exactly like Jesus. Now my kids don't say that. Here's what they say. I don't think Mary would talk to Jesus that way. And then I say, well, if you start acting like Jesus, I'll start acting like Mary. But in the meantime, go and run, because I can catch you. We, we see Christ in, in, in each other, don't we? Isn't it easy for us to see the presence of Christ and we, when we look at another woman? Why is it so difficult to see it in ourselves? Why is that? If we believed in the measureless love of God, we would live differently. When you feel loved, don't you live different? Do you? Or do you probably feel loved all the time? Do you feel loved all the time? Come on, participator, I'm gonna go over time. <laughs> so the remedy for measuring up too is to grasp, grasp the measureless love of God. There is no substitute. And it's when something comes in between that we start believing things that are just not true. How about the second question? Who are we trying to measure up for? Who are we measuring up to was number one. Who are we trying to measure up for? Who are we trying to please? Are we trying to please people? Some of us ladies, we like to people please, don't we? But if we're trying to please God, it says that in the scriptures, are you trying to please them or me? And we're like, well, it depends on the day and the person. But if we're trying to please God, really, if that's the first thing, it's almost more likely that we'll please them too, isn't it? If we're being love and seeing love, being Christ and seeing Christ, trying to just please God, isn't it more likely we'll please the people in our life? Isn't it? Yeah, so I was someone who was like, I, I, I like affirmations. I mean, a hundred of you could say I, this was so fun and the one person who goes, I thought she was obnoxious. I would follow you home and go, but what could I do to make you not feel that way? Isn't that so sad? It's so sad. And actually, I'm doing great with it now. Now I just say, now I can honestly say, I don't care if you like me. I used to care. Now I just say, you know what, Jesus? I turned it over to you. It's really, your, it's really on you now. It's your problem. And plus, if they're in the church, they have to pray for me and love me. They, they don't have to like me, but they have to love me. Bishop Kagan said, he said it. 
So when you are someone who likes the compliments, you can be complimented by one, but then cut to the quick with a criticism. Right? It's like compliments here, criticisms to Shannon. Yeah, do that. So my husband used to be my measure up to person. Um, and then I just decided this, you cannot please this man. He's a, he, do you, I just, it's kind of deceiving because doesn't he look like a happy guy? I mean, doesn't he look like a happy guy? He is so not a happy man. He's not, he's so, but it's so funny because he doesn't mean to be so unhappy. He just makes me want to follow Jesus more. <laughs> he does. So I just realized, you know, when you realize you can't make somebody happy, Shannon just said it too, is that we can, all we can control is ourself. How we show up, what we do, how we represent, believe, receive, conceive the measureless love of God. And because someone else might not know it, well, then we better be showing it. We can't just tell them about God's love. We have to be about God's love, especially now, don't we? So here's the thing. It's so much easier to get God's approval because he just loves us. And if you try to get other people's approval, you might not get it and then you'll be sad. So why would you do that? Why do you do that? When God's over here saying, you're beloved, chosen, forgiven, adopted, redeemed. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. What do you care what they think? Wouldn't we live different if we weren't trying to please people but please God? Isn't that true? One time I got this hate letter. It basically said, I hate you. <laughs> I still have it. I don't know, why would you save that? Why would I save that? I saved it. And unlike all the love letters I've gotten from people in my life, this I keep right on my nightstand. It said things about how much they, they didn't like the values that I talked about, the standard that I held our kids to. And I don't mean standard like we were better, but just some values that we were gonna honor no matter what. And so some beautiful woman stepped into my life, a very good and godly friend, and she said to me, what do you care what they think? Because of course the woman who wrote the letter spoke in French and she didn't just say, I hate you. She said, we, we hate you, we hate you, we hate you. We all hate you. The whole community hates you. That's why I come to Bismarck to speak. Because <laughs> a prophet ain't a prophet in his own hometown. Anyway, so she said to me, this was, this was really wise. She said, how can God give you a bigger platform if you care about a couple people in this community? Now she wasn't telling me not to care. But wasn't that wise? I was so consumed, so consumed with measuring up two and measuring up four and then realizing if I'm pleasing God and I'm just at the standard and li living a call, living a life worthy of the call that I've received, like that's good enough for God. And if somebody else doesn't like it, that's okay. But if I, if I couldn't reconcile that, I couldn't stand before you. And I think part of the reason why they keep your face as dark is so I can't see you going like, is this almost over? <laughs> or like rolling your eyes. You know how us Catholics do. It's like, it's fine, I'll do it. <laughs> you know how when we voluntold people, like at the fish fry, you know, those kind of things where we're supposed to be happy and joyous and it's like, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> For Jesus. We got to do better at that, girls. Like our, our Protestant brothers and sisters really do that way better than us. It's like, is there any joy in there? It's like, it's in there. Come out joy. Don't they? Yeah. Okay. So it's exhausting trying to get approval from other people other than Jesus. How about, who are we measuring God by? See, I... I I measured God by my dad. And see, I didn't learn about my father's love for my father. 
I didn't learn about my father's love from my father because you know what, you can't give what you don't have. And my, my father is a man who's 88 years old and he still does not know that God loves him. And that there's nothing he can do to earn it, to lose it. He doesn't know that. And so I was kind of measuring God by that guy. Does that make sense? And thinking, well, if that's the way God is, you can have him. See, Isaiah 40, 25 says, who are you going to compare me to? You're going to actually compare me, God, to somebody? To whom would you compare me with as if we were equals? We make God so small. When he just wants to pour out this love upon us in such a way that it changes us. So we can more authentically see him and be him. See, I didn't know who I was and I definitely did not know to whom I belonged. I didn't know, I had this case of mistaken identity. And it took me to places and spaces that I promise you, you would not want to be in and you certainly wouldn't want your daughters to be in. But see, I know now that, that God doesn't look at that, what I did as who I was. It's just what I did. Do you know the difference? Shannon, I want you to thank me because I'm just drilling all your points right home. You know how she was talking about that? What you did doesn't define you, it doesn't confine you, but it can remind you of the goodness and the glory of God. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. God's such a show off. Isn't he? He's got to like do these really big things because people are like, where did you come from? Like what rock did you crawl out under? He just chooses these people. Can I tell you, I used to come to conferences like this. And I would sit back there and I would just beg God to give me a clicker. <laughs> I was like, I want to do that. I want to talk about how much God loves them. I want them to know that they can't measure God's love because it's measureless. And guess what? I got it. Because here I am. Isn't that crazy? It's like so crazy to me. And this is the guy who's getting me to heaven. This guy. Look, at, I'm so funny I have to have on my notes, slide click. Slide click. That means click the slide. Not yet, I don't think. But just in case. It got stuck somewhere. So there you go. Melanie's holding up a, is that a 10? Are you saying I'm a 10? Oh, it's 10 minutes. Darn. All right, 10 minutes. Okay, who compares and despairs? Do we compare and despair sometimes? Compare leads to despair, doesn't it? See, he wants you to know that he's the one. He's the one, he's all you need and everything else is a substitute. Why do we settle for substitutes? Well, we can have the real thing. We can have the real thing. We get the body and the blood of Jesus. Why would you go anywhere else looking to be satisfied? See, we're not supposed to compare his measureless love with another's. How about this? He wants to fill us to the measure. Who wants to be filled? Fill me up. That's kind of like the prayer that says, help me, Jesus. It's kind of like that prayer. Fill me up because all excess. Oh yeah, here we go. Oh yeah, where's that, where's that one about excess? Oh yeah, I go. All excess is rooted in emptiness. Isn't it? When we're looking for something else to fill us, it means something isn't there. 
When we're looking for something else to fill us, it means something isn't there. And some of us have made a, our lifelong journey about what's not there and what happened and you don't know my story. And so that's why I think you guys all should, who was wondering what we're doing with this? Yeah, this is exactly what you think it is. Someone tell me what this is. I can't hear you, Bismarck. It's a dog collar, it's, yeah, and it's also, it's an Elizabethan cone of shame. So I spoke one time in this church and this woman said to me, can I take that home and bedazzle it? <laughs> she, she literally bedazzled, do you see this is, did you ever see a dog walking around with one of these? <laughs> the sad thing is the other day the dog next door had one on and my daughter goes, look mom, that's that thing you wear. The best was when I went to get this at the, at the veterinary clinic because I called ahead and said, do you have a dog collar? And she's like, absolutely. So I went and I said, I'm here to pick up the dog collar. She said, what, what size? And I go, oh, there's sizes. Let me check them out. So she brought them all out and I started to put them on. So she sat at her desk like, like she was dying for the veterinarian to come out. So she finally mustered up enough courage to go, you know that's for our dog, right? I go, yeah, I do. So I kept clipping it. Anyway, what does this do for a dog? What's a purpose? I can't hear you. Yeah, keep you from licking your wounds. Someone asked me if I actually sold these at my table. I could sell them if you really would wear them, but imagine if, if, imagine really if we just stayed focused and fixed on the measureless love of God. We didn't lick this and break open this, just we gotta let our stuff heal. See, wounds don't hurt when they become scars. Do they? They don't hurt. But they need healing. We are, we are a people who desperately needs healing. And if you have to buy one of these and get my friend to bedazzle it, so you don't have to be licking your wounds and talking about all the shoulda, woulda, couldas. I think one thing Shannon and I are proof of is that God's grace is sufficient and there is no depth of darkness that we could go to or go through that he just doesn't say, it was in the cooler the whole time. It was in the cooler the whole time. It's when we stop looking, stop believing, stop perceiving that this love is so, it, it's a gift. But doesn't a gift have to be received? And we're like, no, I'm good. God's like, no, really, no, I'm good, I'm good. I'll just settle for less. I'm good. Who does that? Raise your hand, we do that. We ask people to step up and act like Jesus and they can't. All excess is rooted in emptiness. I think I have three minutes left. <laughs> okay. How high, how high? Click. As high as the heavens are above the earth. That's how high. Ephesians says how high, how wide, how long, how deep. He's giving you those because he's talking about things that are measureless. It can't be measured. As high as the heavens are above the earth. That is how much God loves you. Do you know that? Because I do. I know it. I know it with every fiber of my being that he loved me that much. That much. And he has birthed a ministry out of my misery. He has allowed my, just, just, just the raw destruction of my life to be a voice of hope for other people. And he's such a show off. How wide is it? Well, I gotta tell you a little bit more about high, how high it is. 
It's like Jesus is saying, why are you so empty when I love you so much? Why are you looking at what's wrong instead of what's right? How wide it is as far as the east is from the west. Like as far as that. And I'm, I am so geographically inept, but I think that's really far. It feels like how far it was for me to get here from Moorhead. That's how far it feels, here to there. See, this love of God isn't license to do the wrong thing. It's an invitation to do the right things. And the right things mean those things that are pleasing to God because there's nothing that we want more than to be a fear of not pleasing him. Like, I just don't want to do anything. And I, I do a lot of things, like a million. But I don't want to. I don't want to do anything that would displease God. But when I do, I know that his love is not contingent upon what I did or didn't do. It's worth knowing, and I'm talking not this knowing, but this knowing. See, we know this, but do we know this? We know this, but do we know it deep in our heart and soul that his love is measureless? Can't be measured. We got to believe that we are who God says we are. And even more importantly, he is who he says. He is who he says. He does what he says. Believe it, it happens. So many times I say, like, I can't believe that happened. And then I think, of course it happened. It's God. And that's what he does for me. Do you see, who would not want to stand on a stage and just talk about themselves? <laughs> that's what I do. I literally just talk about myself for an hour. Okay. How long from everlasting to everlasting? This is very exhausting. I work with a girl in corporate America doing leadership development, and she always says to me, I just need a nap before I have to spend time with Judy. Isn't that mean? <laughs> Yesterday, I called my husband. I was so excited. I was driving here, and the first thing he said is like, calm down. Like, you had way too much coffee. Here's the other reason I bring this, because then I'm like, oh, yeah, I know I did. Because I get so excited about these little things about how God works in my life and I want to share it with people. Because I know it's everlasting to everlasting. How deep is it? It's deeper than waters that cover me and deeper than the enemy that seeks to destroy me. See, I don't care if you slipped in your pit, you fell in your pit, you jumped in your pit, or someone pushed you in your pit. You could never go so far that God cannot reach you. You could never be so far that his love can't retrieve you. Never, ever. He's what we need. I tell my kids, like, nobody's cooler. Well, I'm kind of cool. My kids don't think I'm cool. They say to my husband, if, if, if mom was dead, you'd be cool. I think that's a compliment of my husband and not so much of me, but I'm not sure. But since I ain't trying to please them, I don't care. Yeah. Okay, so here's, do I have to go now, Melanie? Is it time? Yeah, she says yes. She's giving me the big T. Is that truth or time? I want the truth and the time. Okay, greater than pen or tongue can tell reaches beyond the highest star to the lowest hell. His love is measureless. You're going to want to tell your friends that. Thank you, my friends. Thank you, thank you.